But anyway, uh, he's going to show us how he turns his bowls, and uh, hope you guys enjoy it and learn something. <coughs> okay, hey, so please. can everybody hear me? Good. Back row? Yeah, all right. So today we're going to be going over bowl turning. We'll be talking about the cuts for it, cutting with the grain, different grain orientation options you can use to make your bowl turning go a little bit easier. So I've got a piece of maple on the lathe here. It's green. I just cut this up recently from a log. And uh, when I get my logs like this, I slab here and here and then straight down the center. The cut down the center takes the pith out of my piece of wood. That way it doesn't crack. And the two cuts on the other sides give me a face on both ends. So it's a little bit easier to turn on the lathe. Now the grain on this blank is going here. So the log would be shaped like this and the pith would be right here. So when I turn the bowl, I'm going to get a grain pattern like this, where it's kind of like spider webbing into the center. If I were to turn this blank around, I'd get a very different pattern and it would give a lot of different results. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're mounting it on the lathe. So I'm going to start it off here. I'll speed it up till it starts to shake a little bit. You guys are brave. <laughs> Here's the line of fire. Okay. I'm at four, 490, about 500 RPMs. I've got a 5 8 inch bowl gouge. My grind is a swept-back Irish grind or the Ellsworth grind. And it's not a single facet bevel. I do have a second relief grind taking the heel off. It's a lot easier to work with. So we're going to go ahead and start off. So when I start turning, I just like to flatten off this face to get it a little more in round. And what I'm cutting here is side grain. If I were to cut end grain, it'd be sort of bouncing, it'd be chipping, it'd be a lot rougher of a cut, it wouldn't be as easy. Cutting side grain is a lot smoother, so to do that, all I want to make sure is that I'm cutting in from this direction. I don't want to push in this way, I don't want to push out this way, all I want to do is work the wood to my left. So now we get it a little more in round, I can start turning up my speed gradually. going to do is bring this curve around just a little bit more. It's all in round and what I'm going to do now is shape this tenon and just sort of even out the outside a little more. What kind of cut are you doing now? This is a, I think it's called slicing cut and a lot of guys will think push cut, pull cut, those are your only two options with the pole gouge. I hardly ever use push cuts or pull cuts. The only cut I ever use is that slicing cut. I can take heavy cuts, I can make really light finishing cuts, and it uses the entire side of that bevel. I'm using the entire wing, never the tip. So all I do is present it so that the cutting edge is actually not touching right away, just the bevel, and it's rubbing. I slowly turn it in until it starts to cut, and then I'll sort of sway my body with it and bring that cut all the way around. It leaves a really good surface and it's actually not that hard to do. Okay, so I just rough shaped the tenon with the bowl gouge 
And what I use now is a diamond parting tool. And I actually ground this down with my grinder to match the profile of the dovetail on my chuck jaws. So that way I never have to worry about shaping the chuck or the tenon totally to fit my chuck. All I have to do is bring this in, make sure everything's looking nice. So I push in from the side. Again, I don't want to come in from here because I'm going to be touching the end grain and it's going to want to snap down. So just from the side. I'm looking for one thing when I'm shaping the tenon on a bowl. I want to have a flat shoulder right there. And right here, I want to have a nice flat face for the face of my chuck jaw to fit up against. This is going to prevent it from breaking off or from flying off. It's going to give it a nice, tight, firm grip on there. So now I can take this out. Okay, so I've got my chuck put it on the headstock. So now you can kind of see here what I was talking about when the dovetail on the chuck jaws matches up totally with the tenon. Gives a nice firm grip. It's not going to come out on me. So I can just tighten it up. And a little tip here is when you tighten up as much as you can on the one end, you can actually turn it and go to the other side because you can usually get a little more from here. And especially with green wood where it's wanting to compress down, it'll compress and compress and your fit will get really loose as you start turning. So it's a good habit to stop and tighten up every now and then. And bring up the live center. It's a little off, it's okay. It's gonna warp anyways. So it's fine. Just wanna make sure it's not gonna touch anywhere. And now I'm gonna flatten off this face. One quick thing I do at this stage is just chamfer over this edge, yeah. just like that, because that's kind of sharp, and if you're at a high speed and you kind of knock into it, you might get a burn or a little cut. What was that? Green yeah, this is green maple. So I can pull this out now. And uh, now, for wall thickness, the key is to be at 10% of the bowl's diameter. So a lot of guys will wonder how thick to leave the wall so you have enough clearance to turn it back and around after it warps. And if we just measure it here, we're at 10 inches, so wall thickness should be at an inch. I go a little bit over just in case something happens. So we'll turn it down to about that mark. I'm gonna start making hollowing passes starting at the center, pushing my way in. I'm gonna talk about this cut in detail here. What I'm doing is I'm starting off with the cutting edge totally closed off to the tool, almost like a shear scraping cut. Because if you come at it like this, a lot of times your tool will sort of skip away on you. So if you really close it off and all you want to do is turn in a little indentation right here before you start opening up the tool. So that's why when you open up the tool, if it does want to shoot back, it will back up against this little wall. So. Keep that in mind. Earlier I mentioned I have a relief grind on my bevel. So I have a little double bevel. All I do is just freehand off the heel of my tool. And what this does is when coming around the inside curve of a bowl, if I have a big fat bevel on there, when you get into this corner right here, the only place where that bevel's making contact is on either end because there is a radius from your grinding wheel. So sometimes it'll be really hard to steer and direct your cut. You might go too far in, you might go too far out, and there will be a little ridge at that bottom. So I, if I reduce this down to really small, I'll be able to come around that corner really smooth and put a nice big radius on it. Um, each pass, I try to match the shape of the outside, so I'll swing it at a certain point, and um, I try to keep that wall thickness even all the way around. At some point, if I start feeling like I'm getting close, I'll pull out um, my calipers and measure it with this, but I don't do that until I start getting around that mark, and then I'll start making sure that the walls are even all the way around.
check the wall thickness, make sure we're nice and even. All right, that's even. Now, the reason why you want the walls on your bowl to be as even as possible is because over time, the bowl is going to warp. It's going to contract and expand and turn into something like an oval. If the walls are uneven, the thinner parts are going to move really, really quick, and the thicker parts are going to move really slow. And because they're going to be moving at different speeds, they're going to break away from each other, and it's going to cause a crack. So if it's at an even thickness, it'll all warp at the same rate, and it won't crack on you. So that is the rough turn bowl. Now how I dry this out is I take anchor seal, it's a wax emulsion, and I brush it just to the end grain. I leave the side grain nice and open, that way it can breathe and dry over time a little quicker. You can put this in a paper bag with the shavings to slow down the drying process and you might reduce your chances of getting a crack, but I don't do that because I'm impatient. So I just put it right on the rack and let it dry for about a year or so. And every now and then you can check it using a couple different methods. One of them is a moisture meter. All this does is tell you the moisture content of the wood. If I look at it right here, we're at 30%. So that's pretty wet. When it gets under 15%, it's dry. It's dry enough to finish turn. Another method is to weigh it. I actually have a paint scale. It measures in grams. It's really, really precise. And you weigh it each time, maybe write it on a slip of paper, and you're gonna see it start losing its weight from the moisture evaporating out. And when it goes even or level and stops losing weight, it's lost as much moisture content as it can get, and that way it's dry. Or you can just give it a year and say good enough. That's kind of what I do more or less. So now we're gonna go ahead and finish turn one of the rough bulls. This is American Elm, and I actually roughed these all in at the same time on uh, February 9th of last year. So these are all under 15% moisture content. Now I do have a wooden jam chuck and you can use one of these, but on a rough bowl, if I'm not concerned about sort of marring up the inside, I'll just put it right over the chuck. So you leave the chuck at that size? Yep. Any size really, it just needs to butt up against and have good contact. So I leave the centers on the bottom of the tenon, that way I can line it back up. And all this is, is a friction fit to keep it in place. Where do you buy Bulldog Chucks? Where do I buy what? Oh, uh, ChucksPlus.com is a dealer of them. And uh, they're really good chucks. The, the chuck jaws are coated with zinc, so they don't rust over time, so you can leave it on a bowl if you want for a long period of time, and they're perfectly fine. Do you ever use mineral oil on your bowls and stuff to keep them from going all around too much? I've actually never heard of that. What is it? That word mineral oil. Mineral oil. Mineral oil. On big, the bowl when it's wet? A big brush and load it on there. And it, it, it really? It move, yeah. I'll have to try that. I didn't hear about that one. Um, I know another thing, a couple things I've tried is trying to dry the bowl with heat. So I've used my microwave going in for about two minutes. Don't use the microwave in the kitchen. My parents hate me for it. The other method I did is boiling it in a really big pan over a propane tank. And I boil them for around an hour per inch of thickness. And it fries the moisture out and then you put it out to let the air sort of get back into it, let the moisture evaporate out. And when it's all dry, the wood content is pretty, pretty dry, dry enough to turn. Do you ever have a uh, two-part epoxy with the resin uh, covering it up on you? I've never tried that either. I, I have... You, you can do that on the micro too. Very oh, really? carefully. Like, <laughs> a I'm sure the smell is worse too, <laughs> trying to box in a microwave. Um, no, I've had really good success with just this method of um, using the anchor seal on the end grain and letting them air dry. So I don't lose too many bowls to cracking or warping. So the first thing I'm going to do is just retrue that tenon because that will warp over time too. And I have a couple methods of doing this. I can use my diamond parting tool or I can use a skew. And you guys already saw the parting tool, so now I'm going to show you guys the skew method of doing it. So all I do is come in from this way, so I'm pushing into the side grain for a smoother cut and just make sure that the dovetail and the shoulder are shaped up nice and true. That's about it. I can bring this around and use my bowl gouge again just to true this up. It really hasn't warped too badly. All I'm going to do is make one cut to true it up and then just hopefully one more cut to get a nice clean surface on it. 
and I'm at about 800 RPMs. And I could stop right there. There's actually not too much tear out on it. It's right here. And what tear is caused by is at that point where the end grain sort of transitions into side grain tends to chip out. So like for a visual, it'd be like trying to carve the end grain of a two by four. When you push to the end, it might chip the edge. So this is, this would be where the two by four is at. And when I come around here, it sort of tears out the grain. So we can sand that out. I'm not going to do too much sanding on this. But I will talk about a few different finishing cuts you can make. Now my favorite is that slicing cut. Just really straight up and down. I choke up on the tool and a really, really fine cut. And this will leave a fantastic surface on the wood. You ever do it with a skew? I'm not a skew guy. <laughs> I, I use the skew just for this tenon. That's the only thing I ever use a skew for. So. But you can see the type of finish that leaves there. You can see the torn out grain right here versus here. Now the other thing you can do is use a shear scraping tool that looks like this. This is from John Jordan. He sells them online along with a lot of different hollowing tools. And all you do is the bevel is at 45 degrees. It's almost like a scraper. I could probably do the same thing with a scraper, but uh, this is pretty easy to use. All you do is start the lathe. Come in at about this angle and just take a really light cut. It doesn't slice, it scrapes. So you're just kind of scraping over the surface. And you can see it does take a lot of the tear out out of that wood grain and um, cleans up the cut a lot. And the bevel is not riding in that cut, correct? No, it's just scraping. So the bevels here, you could use it kind of like a skew if you wanted to. I don't. Um, you just sort of use it like this and let it scrape down on the burr. And you can do the same thing with a bowl gouge just by taking your bevel and closing it off like this. This is the cut I'd recommend to anybody starting out who cannot get the hang of this cut. This one's really easy. So on this one, there's virtually no tear out at all. It's a nice clean surface. So now we can take it out of our jam chuck. We can back this out and take out the center. And we can put it back into our chuck jaws. You don't mark your chuck shell when you take it out, right? Do I mark what? You don't mark your chuck shell when you take it out. The, the, nope. Uh, and that's close enough. Truthfully, it's only within probably a sixteenth of an inch just on the one side. So totally all the way around, it might be like a thirty second of an inch off. And uh, I can I can live with that. So we'll tighten up the chuck jaws again from both sides. And I start bringing down the walls only an inch or so time into the bowl. I don't want to do this like how I roughed in the bowl making pass after pass, bringing the wall thickness down because as it gets thinner, towards the bottom of the wood, when I try to make a cut up here, it's gonna to wanna to chatter a lot. So if I leave the wood thick down here, I can make really nice stable and sound cuts towards the lip because I have all the wood to support it. So it won't chatter, I get a much cleaner, cleaner cut. One thing I like to do on the lip of a bowl, if I don't wanna round it over, a really kind of it's kind of an artsy look on a bowl is to flare it in and have nice sharp corners on either end. So if you're bringing, if you're bringing it flat like this, it kind of looks a little blocky. And if you sort of just narrow it in and then start your cut on the inside of the wall, it really gives it a nice unique look.
And you want the walls to be even, not so much because of how it's going to dry, but because it feels a lot better to have a nice even wall all the way across. It's kind of one of the signs of like a well-turned bowl is not to have it be really fat at the bottom. So we just set these to about there. I'm going to remove just a little bit of material at the lip. Okay, so I got a nice clean surface off of that finishing cut. So now what I'm going to do is, I would make a finishing cut, but there's no need. It's kind of smooth already, so I'm just going to push this thick material back in, just maybe another inch or so, and I'll keep doing that until I get to the bottom of the bowl. And we can also move in the tool rest to get a little more stable of a cut. So there's just a little bit of tear out on this side. So I'll show you guys the finishing cut I use for the inside of the bowl. You can use the shear scrape just like this and come up on the end grain like that. And that does give a good surface as long as you don't push too hard or you like pressure. The other finishing cut I use is Again, like a slicing cut. I'm using the entire bevel and a really fine cut and the shavings kind of fling off it. And how you do it is you use left to center to the nose of the bowl gouge. And you, this is a really catchy cut, so you just kind of bring it in slowly until it starts cutting and then sort of push your way into the center. But it does leave a really clean surface. And that tear out is gone. So you can adjust the tool rest again as far as we can get it. shatter those spirals on the inside when you're not getting a really good cut the tool might sort of bounce and it'll leave a texture on the inside that I don't really like it's almost like a spiral so I'm just gonna go ahead and scrape that out real quick well that's good so it's a little short of a tool rest for this but we're gonna make it work bring it in about there and now I'm just going to sort of flatten this off and bring that curve in. So it's not too bad. I'm just going to make one quick little pass over it. Try to make sure one cut, one tool you can use for this too is the scraper because if you get a nice wide face on there, a cut, get a lot of surface area, you're not going to have so much like ridges. You can sort of make it all flat and come across. So on the bowl gouge, if you're kind of like not really smoothly guiding that bevel and you might come in a little too far, sort of not make a nice clean pass through, kind of like I did right here, you might have a little ridge or a high spot or a low spot, and the scraper really does a good job of sort of cleaning those out. I'm not gonna use it, because I'm not really a big scraping kind of guy, and I'll just go over it one more time <laughs> with the bull gouge. Nobody saw that. <laughs> Good enough. So now we can take it out of the chuck. And normally I would sand this at this point, and I sand with a uh, close quarters drill. This one's 12 bucks for Harbor Freight. And a lot of guys hate on this. I've had this one for almost two years now, no problem at all. I have a Rolox setup with the foam pad and hook and loop paper. I start at 180 and I'll go all the way to about 400 or 600. And uh, that's how I sand out any high spots or any tear out that I might have left in the bowl. So now I use the jam chuck because the chuck would really mar up the inside of a bowl. So just a wooden block like this. 
will do just fine. And I forgot to bring it, but I have um, shelf and drawer lining. The stuff people put on like the bottoms of the shelves and stuff, it's sticky, it's kind of grippy. And I'll sort of triple or quadruple that up and I'll sort of foam it over the top of my jam chuck. And this does a couple things. It really cushions up the inside of the bowl. It also gives me a little more grip. But you can use pretty much anything. I'm just gonna use these napkins right here just so I don't get any like marks on the inside of my bowl. So we can bring it up on the center. And there's a few different ways you can do this. All we're gonna do is turn off this tenon really quick. You can do this with a set of cold jaws in your chuck, just really big chuck jaws that clamp it around the lip. You can use a vacuum chuck in your headstock. But this is a really simple method and uh, it is the cheapest thing to do just to get the tenon off of the foot. Sometimes when I first started, I even just used my disc sander and just flattened off the bottom. But uh, anything really would work on this. <coughs> and we don't really need to be too centered on this. No one's going to notice if it's sitting a little off. That doesn't sound right. Does that noise bother anybody? No? All right. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. <laughs> it's not too bad. You're not going to be able to hear it over the... All right. Okay. I don't hear it. I don't know why this happens sometimes. Maybe it's that? I don't know. Well, we didn't sand this anyway, so I'm not really too concerned with the jam chuck. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to work with it. Okay, so I'm going to use a couple things to get the tenon off. I've got my hole gouge again, and when I get close to the center, I use my spindle gouges. So what I do on the foot of a bowl is I bring it in so it's concave. That way it sits flat. And um, I use this spindle gouge right here. We'll do a little bit of detail work on the foot. This right here is a texturing tool and I can let on like spiral or cross hatching designs and I will sometimes do it on the lip of a bowl. Though I really like doing it just on the foot. It adds a nice touch. I'll show you guys really quickly how this guy works. We'll do it right on that bead that I just made. So the speed really has to be slow for this guy to work. You don't want to work at this sort of a high speed. Go down to about 280. And you can see there, it'll just lay down sort of like a little spiral pattern and it looks kind of neat on the foot of a bowl. Right here, I bring this down as thin down as I can go. And I've got my other spindle gouge just solely dedicated to do this one cut. The difference is I've got this bevel at 45. This one's at a really steep, kind of like a 40 or a 35. So I can really control the cut a lot better. And I can get it into some pretty tight spaces. So I'll bring the speed up. I just got some 180 grit and you can just knock down that high spot really quickly. Got any questions? How did you learn how to do all this stuff? <laughs> Lowered expectations. How old oh. were you when you did this bowl? I started turning when I was 13. So I'm 17 now. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> Tell us all about yourself. Some, some people were asking you, what, what got you into it? Um, when we moved into the house we're at right now, there was a shop in it, or just like a room that we thought would be a good shop. 
And my dad bought my grandpa's set of tools. These were all really old Craftsman um, Powercraft brand from around the 50s and 60s. So we bought all of them and in there was a lathe, a bandsaw, and a drill press were the big ones. And um, I watched some videos on YouTube about doing lathe work and I knew that we had one so that's kind of how I got started. Any other questions? What are you using right there? What is that? This is sandpaper? It's 180 grit? The, the oh, this was the um, foam pad to go onto the drill right here. This is what I would sand with, but it makes a nice little sanding block too. I have a question. Yep. At what age do you plan on having your picture in a wood turning magazine? <laughs> <laughs> I was in a wood turning magazine. I was in more wood turning magazine uh, last year. But I, it's more of a hobby for me than it would be for like a profession. I just enjoy working with the material. I enjoy being creative with it. And um, it's... Oh uh, yeah, that's kind of where I got started. And that's why I have my own YouTube channel. So I kind of wanted to like give back the community that's helped me out and got me started in this. So I have um, collaborated with other YouTubers to help out the community in general and teach people how to do this type of thing. So that's kind of where I got started. Where do you got to put on your computer to get you on YouTube? What did I do to go on YouTube? How did we do it? Oh, um, Google. Google is sort of like the platform for YouTube, Gmail, and all the other companies. So what you do is you just set up a Google account. It takes like five minutes and you get a YouTube channel with it. So you can upload your own videos. And what I have recently done is hooked up what's called an AdSense account. And AdSense is a company that will play like advertisements before you play a video, you know, like skip to ad in five seconds or whatever. And I know a lot of people hate those, I hated them. but. What happens is for each view that those ads will get, I will get a certain amount of revenue. YouTube takes a certain cut of it and I take the rest. So I can actually make money uploading videos to YouTube, which is what I've been doing uh, for about the last month. What's your site? Because I put Peter Matthew Wilson and I don't know where you are. Oh, uh, you search Peter Matthew Wood Turner on YouTube? Yeah. Oh, it should have been coming up. <laughs> um, that, that should be it. Peter Matthew Wood Turner. I have like a little guitar pick, a wooden guitar pick for my logo. No, I don't have your side. Really? No. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so confused. It should be coming up. Well, we don't see it. I think it's because we don't see your face. No, just for us. Yeah, those are all my videos. Those are all your videos. All of them. All, all of them. Oh, I have hey. probably 120 <laughs> videos up so far. <laughs> so there, there, there's a lot of them up there. <laughs> yep, those are all my videos. <laughs> You got any more questions? What are you putting on there now? Wax? Beeswax? This is a beeswax and mineral oil mix. Okay, I mixed that stuff too. Yeah, I should have done this while it was on the lathe, but uh, just last minute decision to finish this off. Because I didn't sand this, so I was thinking I wouldn't really finish it. I like, I like using that stuff. It's pretty yeah, easy. It's easy finish. It looks good. <laughs> I'll show it to you all. The what? Yeah, here. I can pass it on. This is the diamond part. This is the shirt straight bird. You guys can pass those around if you want to. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay, everybody, it uh, looks like we're done. We're going to pass that around a little bit, but uh, we need some help cleaning up. Our next meeting is April 9th. Okay, Tom's going to do.